Where I want to start is the current model of marketing, yeah? So the current model of marketing is basically predicated, I think, on a left brain, right brain metaphor for how the human brain works and how people make decisions. And if you think about the whole of the, the kind of marketing and the way we do it, the best, the best metaphor that I've ever come across for the current model of marketing is the following. It is a fist of a brand proposition wrapped in a velvet glove of emotion. The velvet glove is what lures people in, and then we can hit them with why our brand is better than their brand and persuade people to buy. Yeah? It is essentially a persuasion-based model of how marketing works and how human beings make decisions. Yeah? I mean, I know it's a simplification, but I hope it, it kind of resonates and rings true. And whether you're doing concept development, whether it's insight, benefit, reason to believe, or it's advertising development, where it's real fist of a proposition wrapped in a velvet glove, I mean, that is generally the approach we take. All right. There is a new world. And uh, in the next, um, I don't know, 25, 30 minutes, I'm going to give you the bluffer's guide to it. But just a show of hands. I promise it will be the last show of hands. Uh, by the way, there's no PowerPoint, but there will be some audience participation. Okay, so at this point, your, your bums will be a bit numb, so you'll appreciate at least the first one. But the first is, could I have a show of hands for those people, and I use these words very carefully, who own a copy of Thinking Fast and Slow? Okay, so hands in the air. If you own a copy, you possess a copy of Thinking Fast and Slow, keep your hands in the air. They're not that many, actually. That's interesting. Keep your hands in the air if you got to the end. Not many, even fewer. We did, we did a book club last year, and we were sending out this book. This is Daniel Kahneman, okay? So Daniel Kahneman, who's the grandfather of behavioral economics, and his claim to fame is he's the only non-economist to win the Nobel Prize for economics, because he's a psychologist. And his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, um, we sent it out to all the clients to do a kind of book club, and I realized pretty quickly that it gets heavy going after about page 100. <laughs> <laughs> and it reminded me, do you remember the brief history of time? You remember the, the uh, Stephen Hawkins, which I think was at the top of the non-fiction bestsellers list for something like two years. And famously, the British publisher put on page 167 a post-it note that said, if you've reached this page, give us a call and we'll give you 50 pounds. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's not nothing. And apparently they got very few calls. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I'm going to try and do my best to, uh, to summarize the whole thing. In fact, if you, want a, if, you, if you enjoy reading these books, I'd recommend Switch by Dan and Chip Heath. I mean, it's similar con the same content, but much more accessible. Um, Dan and Chip Heath, who wrote um, Made to Stick, they tell a good story. Um, all right. So we've got this current model of marketing, yeah, which is this predicated on this left brain, right brain. What Kahneman et al. says is there's a better metaphor for how the human brain actually works and, and we make decisions, and it's called system one and system two. Okay, I realize at this point you're going, oh, right, go on, left brain, right brain, one and two, it's all the same, but here's, here's the thing. System one, and it's one because it's the original human brain, is the instinctive, intuitive, and emotional brain. It's the thinking fast in his book. System two is the slow, deliberate, cognitive, slow thinking part of the book, yeah? Okay, so that's one, uh, one and two. Left brain, right brain is just so 20th century, okay? We're just gonna, we're gonna go with one and two now. Here's the rub, though. If you split system one and system two into computing power, system two, the thinky bit, the clever bit, the bit that separates us from other animals and is amazing, would be 50 bits of computing power, and system one is 11 million. Thinky bit, 50 bits. Feeling, instinctive bit, 11 million. This is why, if the fire alarm goes off now, the only thing you should take away is that we think much less than we think we think. <laughs> okay? <laughs> and I have been as guilty of this as anyone in the industry. I have overthought how much thought is going into marketing and people making decisions, whether it's at the shop shelf or whatever. Okay, I'm afraid the vast majority of decisions, but in the vast majority of in instances by most people, are made totally emotionally, instinctively, and intuitively. And guess what we use the system two bit for? To post 
rationalize the decision that we've made system one. Okay? And if you're thinking, which you may be, well, I could understand that perfume and, to, and, and, and chocolate and, um, and things like that, beer, are all emotional. And down here, we've got pharmaceuticals and electronics and sort of big, you know, or financial services. No. We have one brain. It works one way. The only difference is you need more post-rationalization down at the kind of so-called functional end of things. That's the only difference, okay? And that's true in pharmaceuticals as just as it is in, in, in chocolate. So, a quick demonstration of system one. Are you ready? Very good. Oh, look at this. This is, this is why we're not winning at the Ashes. You know, I did this in India, actually. <laughs> the one time that England beat India at the, the cricket. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, you, really, you should have taught your, 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 you know, your, boat, your, your catchers to be better. And they all threw them back at me. And I was like... <laughs> I've also learned to use paper. I used to have these sort of brain, you know, because, you know, at some point you think it's a good idea to advertise your company with squidgy brains. I mean, it's brain juicer, yeah? <laughs> so I had these, you know, these stress balls. And actually, it was in Chicago, and it was a room a bit like this, you know, really wide. And in my wisdom, I decided to try and engage the people at the far end, and I kind of hurled one that way. And as I turned to hurl this way, I heard this bloop. It was like it went into a coffee cup <laughs> and spilt on the guy's iPad. Oh, my God. I killed his baby. Literally, a hush went across the room. <laughs> ah, anyway, paper, paper, much safer. So system one, catching is pure system one. Yeah? We don't actually calculate the angle of trajectory. We just instinctively do it. Yeah? Robots are bad catchers because they actually have to use system two. Yeah? It's one of the few things we can't teach robots to do very well. It's also the reason we don't bump into people generally on busy streets unless, you know, those moments where we think about it and you think, I'm going to go left. That's when we tend to hit people, okay? Pattern recognition and instinct is actually how we operate most of the time and we're really good at it. System two, on the other hand, we really don't do very well. Here is the uh, rapidly becoming uh, kind of well-known, so you may already know it, we'll see. But this is Daniel Kahneman's example he gave in his Nobel acceptance speech. A bat and a ball cost $1.10 together. The bat is a dollar more than the ball. How much is the ball? A bat and a ball are a dollar ten together. The bat's a dollar more than the ball. How much is the ball? And you know it's a trick, and no one wants to shout out the answer, but come on. What's the answer that comes quickly you know, to your mind? 10 cents, okay? 90 odd percent of people when asked this say 10 cents, and it's not, it's five. And the, the uh, statisticians amongst you will, uh, will quickly get that and can't understand why the rest of us are so stupid as we say 10. But basically, what Kahneman says is we take an answer that comes quickly to mind, it's plausible, it's roughly right, that'll do. <laughs> That's how we do it. And I'm gonna give you some examples around pricing, which prove that even pricing, where we sort of think that we're maximizing, um, things. It just doesn't work that way. Um, by the way, uh, my, my COO, Alex Batchelor, um, tells this lovely story of doing a presentation to sort of 600 accountants. I don't know why he was talking to 600 accountants. And he said, who in the last eight years has bought a new car? You know, pretty much everyone. He said, okay, now really be honest. Who did a discounted cash flow analysis to, to assess the depreciation value on your car? You know, and everyone like, you know, no, 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 no. Apart from this little group down at the front. I'm not saying it's you, but, you know. Apart from this little group down the front. And he was like, really? And they said, yeah, we're actuaries. <laughs> and I don't know if you've met any actuaries, but they're not human. I mean, really. Okay, so human beings, system one, not system two. It's all, it's all emotional. So what I'm going to do is, is um, I don't know if, if any of you enjoy reading these sorts of books like Nudge and The Herd and, you know, kind of thinking fast and slow. But if you're anything like me, you know, I'm there and I'm reading one particular brilliant experiment anecdote. And I'm sort of thinking, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. That changes everything that we've been doing. And then I've forgotten the one that's ten, that I read 10 minutes before. And I've lost completely how the whole thing fits together. So, so this is, what I'm going to do is an attempt, it's just an attempt, to try and kind of, you know, take the whole of behavioral science and simplify it into three lenses three ways of looking at marketing, which I think, I hope, if I do it right, you'll be able to actually just use. Hopefully you'll remember and you'll be able to use. And they are these. Framing, no decision is made out of context, and context and framing changes everything. It's massively important. 
copying, copying is what we do. We are social animals and we are absolutely brilliant at copying, yeah? And feeling. I've got news for you. Feel nothing, do nothing. The worst possible thing you can do in marketing is do something so bland that no one feels anything. Okay? Feel nothing, do nothing, feel more, buy more. That's the, that's the sort of the three lenses. And I'm, I'm going to try and give you a brand example, a shopper example, and market research example, since, you know, that is what we do uh, in each of these. But there will be audience participation at the beginning of each of these to demonstrate it. So if everyone can alleviate their numb bum and stand, thank you. What I would like you to do, no one shout it out if you know the answer. As a group, we are going to basically dis determine how old Mahatma Gandhi was when he died. Okay, and I'm going to start counting from 66. And what I want you to do is just sit down when I get to the age that you think Mahatma Gandhi was when he died. Okay, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, 74. Okay, okay, so I'm saying, you know, this is an instant average, you know, about 73, 74. If everyone can stand up again. Exactly the same task, but I'm going to start at 90. 90, 89, 88, 87, 86, 85, 84, 83, 82, 81, 80, 79, 78, 77, 76, 75, 74. Okay, all right. So on average, I think it was just a, probably two years more. It's probably about 75, where it was 73. And I know what you were thinking. You're thinking you're, you're, you're battling with the consistency principle. Yeah? <laughs> I sat down at 72. I'm going to wait until he gets to 72. I mean, you know. On the other hand, everyone else is starting to sit down. Maybe it was older. I don't know. <laughs> the answer is 78, exactly in the middle between the two. But it nearly always works. that You always have a slightly higher result second time than first time. That's anchoring. Anchoring, the numbers, almost random sort of sometimes numbers can affect what we do. The best example for me of framing, or the most extreme example, is Rolls-Royce. Rolls-Royce apparently sell more cars at boat shows than they do from their car showrooms. Because when you're looking at 10 million euros, dollars, pounds worth of yacht, half a million on a car seems a bargain. I'll take two. <laughs> And although it's funny, it is. We just think this is mad, isn't it? But context drives everything. The, the version that we all know of this is, is basically wine lists, yeah? So on a wine list in a restaurant, you've got one super crazy priced wine, which only Russian oligarchs buy. And basically, you've got the house wine, which the Dutch buy. Yeah? That's, you know. By the way, I am going to try and insult all nations equally by the time we get you know, to one, one o'clock. You know, I don't want you to feel left out. But yeah, so, so context drives everything. The example I'm going to give you um, is pricing. I want to do a pricing example just because the more I sort of talk about this and the more you get into it with clients, it's almost a bit like I said, people believe that it works for chocolate and perfume, but find it harder to believe that it works for high tech and pharmaceutical. The other thing that I tend to find is, yeah, 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 I can see that in design and advertising, but when it comes to pricing, Pricing is serious. I mean, pricing is where homo economicus, the maximizing individual, surely comes into it, where we actually think about pricing. Oh, yeah? OK. So here's a lovely example. The Economist magazine basically sold two subscriptions online. For $59, you could get the online content only. Yeah? Or for $125, you could get the online content and the paper copy delivered 125. So 59 online only, 125 you get the content. Not surprisingly, perhaps, 75% of people chose the cheaper option. So, so far it looks like Homo economicus is alive and well. Then Dan Ariely, who's one of the leading thinkers in this area at Duke University. By the way, if anyone wants the most amazing thing, there is a free online course that Dan Ariely runs at Duke University. And it's great. It's eight weeks, and you just you sign up, uh, and it gives the sort of 101 version. I spoke at a conference last year after one of Dan Ariely's sort of PhD students. Um, and I realized how many of the examples I give are their examples. And I was like, oh my god, what do I go to say now? Anyway, economists. And what they did 
is they then inserted a middle option that makes no sense at all, but changes everything. The middle option was $125 for just the paper copy. So on the site, you've got 59 online content only, 125 for the paper copy only, and 125 for the paper and the online content, which now looks a bargain. And 80% of people now choose that option. No one chooses the middle option, obviously. It's like a dummy option. But imagine what that does to your business. Okay, this is where behavioral science, I think, gets exciting. 75% are paying you $59, and now, basically 80% are paying you 125. Okay, pricing does not work in a rational way. We are not rational, we are system one, and context changes everything, yeah? Market research, quick example, before we go on to social. Packaging testing, pack design, all that sort of stuff, okay. The way that market research comes out, by the way, I think before we do the kind of example, the whole of quantitative market research is a pretty system two edifice. I think it is worth saying this, okay? We have been measuring what we can measure and atomize scales and purchase intention and good old kind of awareness stuff, yeah? And I'm afraid we've been measuring the post-rationalizations largely and not the, the sort of the, the actual motivations. We need to learn to measure system one and system one is what drives decision making. System two is just the post-rationalization. Okay, an example of this would be packaging testing where we basically allow people to sit, scratch their chins, and look at the pack, and kind of go, oh, yeah, yeah, I can see what you're doing there. Yeah, nice, I'll give it a high score on this rating and that rating. And all we did as an experiment is we put people under time pressure. So we asked exactly the same questions, and we basically gave them three seconds to answer every question. Because time pressure means that your system two doesn't get a chance to kick in. You have to give a gut reaction, a quick reaction, and guess what? changes the result totally. Okay, so it was for a particular client, and it was on Whiskers, pet food. And every time Whiskers Mars did, did the you know, packaging testing, it said that their brand was a much better pack, and that Felix, the competitor, was not as good a pack. And yet, in the marketplace, Felix was about to overtake the, uh, Whiskers as, a, as, a brand, as the brand leader. And all we did is we put people under time pressure, and it changed the results. We've then done it in five other different categories, same thing. All right, time pressure is one of the ways of making sure that people answer things system one. All right, so framing, that's our first one. Second one is social. We are social animals. The best book on this, I think, is The Herd by Mark Earls. The summary of the book, I'll give you the summaries of these books uh, so to spare you, but it's, we are much less individual than we would like to think, and we are much more influenced by other people than we would care to admit. We're gonna do a little demonstration. If everyone would like to stand up, and this time I want you to find a partner and uh, turn towards your partner. Now, now we're gonna get very friendly. I would like you to stare lovingly into their eyes. No, no, no. No, I would like you to hold each other's elbows, okay? I want you to hold your partner's elbows, and I have a challenge for you which is you have to get your partner off the ground as many times as you can in the next 30 seconds. Go! <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. I love, I, love watching, I love watching that game. And do you know what? It is very culturally revealing, by the way. I did this in Finland. And literally, they were wrestling each other. I mean, you know, ah! Brazil, everyone starts jumping quickly. So I, the Australia, you're closer to Brazil, you know, cult culturally. But basically, everyone probably has the feeling that they, you individually came up with the brilliant solution. But in reality, you're kind of staring at each other thinking, hmm, not sure. And then out of the corner of your eye, there's, there's, there's somebody jumping and you're going, that's a good, that's a good solution. Let's go with that, let's go with that, let's go with that. Let's Copying is what we do best. We are brilliant mimickers. We copy when in Rome, you know, be as the Romans. And I think marketing has been slightly too much enthralled to one-to-one -to -one marketing and all of that. We can target people so carefully and we, if, if we can lift up their brain and push the buy button. But actually, encouraging people to see what other people are doing, making something seem popular is more important than it being popular. 
So David Bowie famously, when he broke into America, basically paid people to come to his gigs and acted like a diva. And the two things were enough to actually make him sort of successful. iPods, the brilliance of iPods was actually the Y earbuds, which made a largely invisible product suddenly visible. Making things visible, Red Bull, I think, is a brilliant social brand. Yeah, it's a brand that kind of really kind of con conjures up, every alcohol uh, obviously helps, but everything they do is kind of social influence. Um, by contrast, actually, I meant to say, so if the social brand example is Red Bull and, and I, I, iPods, by the way, the other example I like, proof positive that we copy blindly, Crocs. <laughs> and the only country where apparently Crocs weren't successful is Holland. Because when you grow up with the clog as your national icon, you know that even if you color it, it's still naff. But anyway. Um, <laughs> The, the framing example I wanted to share, I mean, the, the, the pricing one is interesting, but actually Nespresso, I know we've got the other version outside, but Nespresso machine, everything about the way it's presented, the, the smell of it, the sound of it, basically conjures up a cafe coffee at home, yeah? And in fact, it's so much cheaper than Starbucks, we think that the machine practically pays for itself, and we love this machine. It is a 500% premium, Okay, those little pods are a 500% premium to what we were buying before for the home. And no one's noticed, and frankly, even if you pointed it out, no one cares. I love the machine, I love it, don't take it away. Yeah? <laughs> okay, framing is powerful stuff. Social, so the social example, you've got that. Amazon are very brilliant at this. You know, people who bought this also bought that. Lists of things, making things visible especially if you're in categories where it's actually quite invisible. I mean, the last, you know, um, Michelle sort of saying a lot of, you know, feminine hygiene stuff is very invisible, but then suddenly there was this sort of burst of color that came out. And I'm, you know, even as a male, I'm conscious that, you know, kind of handbags opening up and colorful things rolling out. God knows what they are. I don't know what they are, but, you know, uh, they look interesting. Is it a sweet? Can I have one? <laughs> <You know? laughs> okay, a shopper example. I'll give you a nice shopper example. We, we were doing some, some, I think we've got to, by the way, it, we've got to embrace much more of an experimental approach. The thing about behavioral science is although a lot of this, the principles are there and it can guide you towards the right sort of things, not the wrong things, but actually you've got to then experiment, A-B testing, almost to see which one works. So we were doing some stuff with a multinational, just on shopper, and we had a couple of really fascinating ones. The first one was shampoo. Okay, so in condition A, it was $1 off the shampoo, and sales went up from 1, the base of 1, to 1.4. Scenario B was $1 off, maximum 4 per person. That was all, okay? It just said on the thing, $1 off, maximum 4 per person. And now, it's not 1.4, but 1.8 that people take off on average, okay? Because scarcity is a social thing. We, if, if something's scarce, a bit like, you know, we, we, we heard, um, you know, on the whole Johnny Walker and sort of stuff, scarcity and elitism and fashion, you know, it can't be too prevalent and it increases the sense of value. Scenario three, interestingly, was one dollar off, maximum eight per person. I didn't need four, I certainly don't need eight. And now, not 1.4, not 1.8, but 2.4. Because it's framing, it's anchoring. Eight is a bigger number than four, and so people take more. By the way, the reason to experiment is we also did it maximum 12, and I think we sold less. I mean, it was like 1.2 or something. So this stuff is, you get a kind of a general sense of how it works, but the specific is you need to experiment. All right, market research example. Concept testing. I'm sure everyone in this room loathes uh, kind of concept testing. Uh, by the way, I'm trying a mini mission to stop insight, benefit, and reason to believe, because that is so basically left brain, right brain. Stop it. Basically, present your concepts as adcepts. Present it emotionally. Use a picture to tell the words. Use as few words as possible, and people can tell you if they love it or hate it. Much better. Anyway, I digress. A much better way of doing concept testing, which breaks all the rules of concept testing, which is why I love it. Uh, I'm a contrarian, if you hadn't noticed already, so I love this. It's called Predictive Markets, and it's the wisdom of crowds. So instead of taking your target audience and testing your new concept monadically and asking them lots of questions about whether they would buy purchase intention, TNS, by the way, put out a paper last year 
which said there, is, there really is no correlation beyond random for purchase intention and what happens in the market. Okay, so purchase intention, that lovely question, really about this much use. <laughs> Predictive markets, on the other hand, you take a crowd of 500 people, okay, a random crowd of 500 people, and you play a game with them, which is I want you to imagine that you own shares in each one of the 15 ideas or maybe 20 ideas we're going to share with you. And all you have to do as each idea pops up is say, I'd probably buy shares or probably sell. And it's your gut feel about whether other people would love it or hate it. So the whole thing is a projection because it turns out we are better at predicting other people's behavior than we are at predicting our own behavior. And if anyone's wondering about this, I don't know if you followed the Italian elections last year, but Berlusconi was running again. The man we all love to uh, mock. And you can imagine the pollster knocking on the door in Milan and going, you know, who are you going to vote for? Would you vote for Berlusconi? No. <laughs> How many of your neighbors do you think will be voting for Berlusconi is a much more accurate question and, in fact, predicted the result much, much more accurately than the traditional polls. Because, basically, wisdom of crowds actually does it. All right. Now, the clock is ticking. The clock is ticking. So we're on to the last one, feeling. All right, I want you to think of something that really pissed you off in the last week. I want you to pull the face of anger. Come on, furrow the brows. I want it. Come on, there are far too many smiles. Come on, I want anger. Give me anger. Pull the face. Because apparently the actual moving of the muscles will start to make you feel that. Okay, so we better stop. All right, now, 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 happiness. Okay, big smile, big smile, and a little chuckle. <laughs> okay, so this, this it, feeling. The thing about feeling is it's really what drives marketing, and we need to do marketing that is more about feeling, making people feel something overwhelming. And the reason that this is interesting and the reason that it's controversial is because I think that advertising has been enthralled to what I call three-star marketing, and it's basically a triangle that sounds plausible of measures, but just isn't, okay? So the fist of a proposition wrapped in a velvet glove is, is the way that we think advertising works. It's basically engagement. We have to engage customers, okay, velvet glove, and once we've got them engaged, we need to impart a message, because otherwise, why the hell would we be spending millions on advertising if we're not imparting any message to persuade? And then we have to remember the brand for which we've been engaged and have the message. So brand recall, my other favorite question to hate, by the way, purchase intention, brand recall. Brand recall is utterly useless. It's a system to measure, to measure system one. Brand recognition is what matters, not brand recall, by the way. Okay, so this golden triangle of plausibility is what pretty much every pretest measures, and it's weighted pretty much equally, and it, and it is a persuasion-based model. I've got news for you. If you want five-star famous marketing and five-star famous ads, not three-star, no message. You've got to make it emotional. The ads that we remember from our youth, the ads that, we, that go viral, that are, are fabulously successful, are almost pure emotion. Make us feel something overwhelming. And the way it works is you don't need to message, and here's why. Because when I feel something really positive about a brand, I ascribe good things to the category. Th whatever the category is, I assume that it's good at them. So you don't need to tell me it's good. You just need to make me feel something. I'm going to demonstrate this, which is a little bit tricky without PowerPoint and showing any, any videos. Okay. However, <coughs> just one cornetto, give it to me, delicious ice cream from Italy. Da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Give me Cornetto from Wool's Ice Cream. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I thank you. I thank you. That advert, one of the most famous ads in the UK, ran between 1976 and 1979, hasn't ever run again. It's still known by people who weren't even born. I don't quite know because it was parodied and things. And it made the brand brand leader. Okay? And it's really got very little information processing or any particular message. Okay, these are the ads. Whether it's PNG Thank You Mums or whether it's Evian Dancing Babies, whether it's Cabri Gorilla. I mean the Cabri Gorilla is such a good example. It's a guy in a gorilla suit drumming to Phil Collins. 
what's it got to do with chocolate? And you can imagine doing the market research where you say to people, did you enjoy the ad? Loved it. Genius, joyous, loved it. Do you think you'd buy more Cadbury's chocolate? <laughs> no. OK, I would say no. We'd all say no. But here's the thing. You do. The evidence, OK, the evidence, the IPA in the UK, the Institute of Practitioners of Advertising, the hardcore econometric model shows that five-star films that make you feel something amazing, even if in research you say, I would not buy any more, you do. It has the biggest return on investment. Three-star advertising, by the way, has a small ROI. It has an ROI, but it's small. One and two-star, you shouldn't ever launch. Most of the stuff is, by the way. But it's four and five-star marketing, and it's emotional marketing that you need to be doing. And that's the stuff that seems almost playful and frivolous. And hopefully, you know, uh, Sir John, uh, who's on this afternoon, will be waxing lyrical about the power of creativity. But that is the sort of marketing, five-star marketing, that I think behavioral science is helping us to deliver. And, and the last thought on uh, dear market research, which is the following. One of the concepts um, from uh, behavioral science is that people tend to fall into being prevention-focused or promotion-focused. And categories can be like this. So life insurance is pre prevention-focused, and generally apps and computer stuff is, is, pr is promotion-focused. But I would say my observation is that market research has been a prevention-focused category. In fact, my first boss at Unilever, when I was getting excited about something, which you may have told I can get excited about things, and I was getting excited about something, and he said, John, John, really frustrating, you have to realize that our job in research is to stop marketing doing stupid things. <laughs> and he said it genuinely, seriously, that is what he, you know, he saw the job as. And I think it's gone on for too long, okay? It's not actually helping that much. And I think behavioral science is giving us an opportunity to be promotion focused, to actually you know, put these concepts and ideas into, into the, you know, the workplace and help marketing do famous five-star marketing. Okay, the final bit I would like to do with you um, is, is, I think, this, this is your, your reward for lunch. Okay, lunch is beckoning. However, you have to do something for it. So from the end here, we're going to start here. And what I would like you to do is the Mexican wave, okay? The Mexican wave, a little bit of social dynamics to finish. And what the thing is, as you do it, you'd stand up and do it, I'd like you to shout lunch, okay? So starting from over there, the Mexican wave, are you ready? One, two, three, go. Not nearly good enough. You are not going to lunch unless it's a bit louder. We're going to start from this end this time. One, two, three. <laughs> Somebody's really hungry. Thank you. Thank you.